our Father which art in heaven. How grateful we are that Jesus taught us how to pray, not going to a priest or a psychiatrist or anyone else to confess our guilt and our sins and to find some way, some other person to hang them on, but we can come right to the throne, approaching boldly as Paul tells us to, in that most holy place where we find Jesus interceding in our behalf. And today, we claim the blood of the only begotten Son of God as our redemption. For within us is nothing good, and without us is nothing good. The whole world is full of sin, and we cannot trust in any other individual. And I pray, Father, today that as we go through these lessons, they will make a deep impression in our minds and cause us to come up higher in that path that leads all the way to the city of God. And as that midnight cry shines from behind us that does not go out until the people of God reach the city with Jesus just before showing the way, we plead for help. If we feel individually we're not on that path yet, Lord, show us what is holding us from being on that path. Whether it's the silken cords of affection for those nearest and dearest to us, or whether it's our job, whether it's a church, whether it's anything on this earth, please show us what is holding us up from following that message of the midnight cry. And we pray this morning for an outpouring of the Spirit of Christ and you, Father, because without these, we cannot rightly divide the word of truth. And this morning, I want to thank you that you have promised us that that faithful few, that remnant, that little remnant scattered abroad, will have the testimony of Jesus Christ, which is the spirit of prophecy. We thank you for these writings that have been so long laying aside as the world marches to a different drum and comes into Romish error and tradition, and custom, and philosophies of spiritualism. Break these holds upon us today, Lord, and may we be free to be true children of the Father and the Son. Is my prayer in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Okay, we sent out a new um, set of uh, deals. I made a couple corrections um, in what was already online for this unconditional love, tunnel of love um, document that I still <laughs> have not finished and sent out. But today, um, with these second ones that we've got online there on our, um, our website, Sabbath School uh, Documents Number 2, we're going to be starting out on page 10. Is there a dangerous kind of love? This is what the world refuses to recognize. This is what the churches refuse to recognize. And so today, this is one of the most important parts of the study so far that we've gone over. And we are starting out, um, as we have been from, the, from page one, we're starting out simply by going through crudence, concordance on love, and this section in there, is there a dangerous kind of love? Um, he starts out with carnal love. And so let's turn in our Bibles to 2 Samuel 13, verse 4. 2 Samuel 13, verse 4. And I've got to get this hooked up. If somebody can read that for us, please. 2 Samuel 13, 4. I can read. Thank you. He said unto him, Why art thou, being the king's son, lean from day to day? Wilt thou not tell me? And Ammon said unto him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. So is this a good love? This was David's daughter, Tamar. And... Um, this young man, Amnon, is also David's 
child. So this would be a half-sister of Amnon's. And he thought he was so in love with her, he wouldn't eat. He wanted his own way. He wanted this forbidden <laughs> love. And if we were to take the time, but which we won't today, if we were to take the time to read the story, he literally gets his way, has her come in, defiles her, and she must not have been on board with this situation. She did plead with him, and that's there in Scripture. But after he had defiled and ruined her, then he hated her. His, his hatred for her was deeper than his love because she didn't go along with his program. And so he cast her from his sight. It says in verse 15, Then Amnon hated her exceedingly. So was it true love to begin with? No, it was not. It was not true love to begin with. It was a carnal, sensual love. It was a I will have my way type of love. Not thinking of the disrespect and the shame and the ignominity that he would bring to her for the rest of her life. So that was definitely a carnal, a wicked carnal love. Let's now turn to Proverbs 7 verse 18. Do I have a reader for Proverbs 7 and verse 18? I can read it. Thank you. It's Proverbs seven eighteen. Yes. Okay, come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with loves. Read verse 19 as well, please. For the good man is not at home. He is gone a long journey. So what does that tell us about this woman who's enticing this man? What does that tell us? The good man is not at home. This it's is an affair. Pardon? Her husband. Yeah. The husband is not home, so she's seducing somebody else. Look, I've decked my bed. I've done aloes. I put all this sweet-smelling thing. I put covered it with tapestries. We're going to have a good time here because my a husband fling. is not it's home. It's called a fling. A fling. Yes. It's called a fling. Is this a, a good love? No. No. The word of God condemns it. In fact, it's against the commandment of God not to commit adultery. So this is a carnal, sensual, wicked love. And... Woe to the man who cannot trust his woman when he's not at home. Woe to that man. Okay. Wicked love. Second Chronicles 19.2. 2 Chronicles 19.2. Do I have a reader for this verse? So Jehu, that son of Hanani, that seer, went out to meet him, saying to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help those ungodly, or love them that hate our Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before our Lord. So here, this king helped somebody who did not love the Lord. And the seer, what's a seer, class? What's a seer? An S-E-E-R. What is a seer? Prophet. It's a prophet who sees in vision the things of the Lord. A seer's, no, it's not a, a what do you call it? A magician. Magician, no. Magicians go with magic and that kind of thing. A seer is one whom the Lord takes and gives visions to. They see magician things. Magician would be a magi. Yes. So magi. here we have Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, who went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Why are you loving and helping the ungodly who hate the Lord? 
the wrath of God is on you. Now we're going to take the time to go see who he helped. Let's just back up to 2 Chronicles 18, verse 1. Do I have a reader? 2 Chronicles 18, verse 1. I can if you want. Okay. Verse 18, 1. Yes. Now Jehoshaphat had riches and honor in abundance and joined a furnace. Affinity yes. Unto Ahab. And that's why I had you only read one verse because of the word affinity. Okay. Now, Jehoshaphat was who? He was the king of um, Judah. Egypt. He was the king of Judah. And yeah. who was Ahab? King of Israel. So here. You have the conference president. We'll just put it in today's verbiage, okay? You have the conference president of Seventh-day Adventism because they were Sabbath keepers and they were believing in the advent of a Messiah, okay? So you had Ahab, the, the conference president of the Seventh-day Adventist church of his day, and you had Judah over here that was a splinter group that were brethren. They were all sons of Abraham and Jacob. But they're the splinter group because they didn't believe in the apostasy of the mainline church. So there were two conference presidents, one of the mainline church, Ahab, and one of the independent group, Judah, and that was Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat, this verse tells us, uh, Brother Floyd just read, he joined affinity with Ahab. Does anybody know what affinity means? I didn't. I had to look it up. Do you know what it means? An everlasting love. No. An inclination, uh, uh, an attachment. Attachment. Uh, hey, hey, there you go. Uh, Like-mindedness. Like okay, but it goes deeper than that. Let's go to um, 1 Kings 3, 1. Let's let the Bible tell us what affinity means, okay? Uh, 1 Kings 3, verse 1. Do I have a reader? This verse defines what affinity means. Do I have a reader? 1 Kings 3, verse 1. I can read it. Okay. And Solomon made an infinity with the Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David until he made an end of building his own house and the house of the Lord and, he, and the wall of Jerusalem around about. So what does affinity entail? A marriage. Either you marry somebody from that family, so they were literally related somehow. I don't know if, because the, the Bible is not clear. I don't know if Jehoshaphat um, caused one of his sons to marry Ahab's, one of Ahab's daughter or vice versa. I don't know if he gave a daughter to we're not told. It just says he had an affinity with Ahab. So somehow the, these men were related. There was whether he took a wife of um, Ahab's daughter to his house or what. We do not know. So let's turn to uh, Ezra 9, 14. Ezra 9, 14. Actually, Molly, if I may... Uh uh, Webster's 1828 uh, defines a relation contracted by marriage between a husband and his wife, kindred. Yes. So between a wife and her husband's kindred, that's the first definition. Exactly. Thank you for reading that, because I forgot to write it in here. I would have had to look it up. I, it does go on to say agreement, relation, conformity, resemblance, connection, uh, as, as in sounds or colors or languages. Right. So, so, so yeah. somehow they were related, whether they were father-in-law, uh, et cetera, or um, whatever. It doesn't tell us, but he made an affinity with the house of Ahab. So there was some marriage relation that happened there. Ezra 9, 14. Do I have a reader for Ezra 9, 14? Yeah. 
we just went through this in our Nehemiah and Ezra, uh, the return of the exiles. So Ezra 9.14. Okay, Sandra. Should we again break thy commandments and join in affinity with the people of these abominations? Wouldst not thou be angry with us till thou hadst consumed us, so that there should be no remnant nor escaping? So remember here the people are pleading with Nehemiah, I think it was, if I recall correctly. I'd have to read a lot of verses. Either Ezra or Nehemiah, we'll put it that way. I think it was Nehemiah. And said, please, let us keep our wives. And he said, what? You're going to bring the wrath of God on us? You have married wicked people who do not want to live for God. Send them out of the camp or go with them. And re remember, Nehemiah pulled out some of their hair and thrust them from him and from the priesthood because they had married. They had an affinity with. So affinity means a marriage relationship. So this is what Jehoshaphat did with Ahab. Now, in, back to 2 Chronicles 19.2, the, the accusation of God is, how shouldst thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? We're talking about family here. This isn't just a neighbor guy. This is family. And their, their affinity, or their affinity um, that we read about made them family, but also... One was of the house of Israel, leader of the house of Israel. The other was the house of Judah's leader. And here, the help that he had given him, if we were to take the time here to read uh, 2 Chronicles um, 19 it show, and 18, it shows that they went uh, to war together. And um, before they went... Jehoshaphat, and I'll just uh, go through these two chapters uh, quickly in telling you. Before they went to this war against the Assyrians, I think it was, or Syrians, um, King Jehoshaphat was really nervous about it. And he said, can we talk to the Lord about this? Can, do you have a seer here anywhere? And, he, and Ahab says, oh, yeah, I've got lots of priests. And so he had them all come in, and they're all like, oh, yes. You're going to be great. You're going to wipe these people out. And Jehoshaphat's just sitting there going, these guys are phony. Did they really talk to the Lord about this? And finally he says to Ahab, don't you have somebody else that we can counsel with? And Ahab says, I have one prophet of God, because that's what he asked for. He asked for a prophet of God. And Ahab says, well, there's this one guy, may, may cut. Maachiah by name, I think it was. But um, I don't ever call on him because he always prophesies against me. Well, why would a true prophet of God be prophesying against the conference president? Tell me, class. Because he's worshiping the wrong God. <laughs> there you have it. There you have it. He's not following the way of the Lord. He has led all the whole church into the customs and traditions of Baal. Okay? So here, he's, he's admitting to Jehoshaphat, uh, I don't call him because he always tells me bad things are going to happen. He always warns me that I'm doing wrong. Makes me feel guilty. And Jehoshaphat says, please, before we go, can we just talk to him? So they drag him in there, and the man says, oh, king, yes, just like your other prophet said, you know, this and that, you're going to come back a victor. And, you, and, and King Ahab said, stop mocking me. Just tell me what's going to happen. And he stood there and he said, thus saith the Lord. That was his clue that he was mocking him. Then he said, thus saith the Lord. I saw all Israel scattered like sheep on the mountains without a shepherd. What did he just tell the king? You go out there to battle, your men are going to just scatter and you're going to die. That's what he told him. And Ahab got mad and he said, see, put him in prison. Get him out of here. I told you I don't. Just go to war with me. Don't listen to him. And so they went to war. And what happened? 
if we were to take the time to read about this account, Jehoshaphat went in his kingly robes, but Ahab was scared. He was scared because he'd heard the word of the Lord. And so he just went in civilian clothes. He went looking like every other so soldier, but he was in a chariot. And as he's riding along in this chariot, running through this battle, um, well, first of all, Jehoshaphat, he, his chariot is surrounded and they're, because he looks like the king. And they're ready to take him out. And he said, oh, God, help me. And God did help him. Because, why? Because here is a man. Here was a conference president who had gone through all of Judah and taken out all the idols and had tried to restore the worship of the true God in, in Judah. And so God heard his cry, and everybody of Syria that had been surrounding him backed off, and he made it through, and he lived. But an arrow just went over there and hits the back of this civilian soldier, and it happened to be Ahab. And they propped him up in the chariot, took him off to the side, propped him up in the chariot, but he died before sundown. So the battle's finished. Jehoshaphat goes back home. And then Jehu, the son of Hananiah, the seer, comes in and says, Why did you help the ungodly and lo th love them? Why do you love them that hate the Lord? The wrath of God is upon you. The wrath of God Molly? is upon you. Yes. Um, <clears throat> the, deal, the, the, the infinity that you were talking about, um, Joha, Joho, excuse me, if I can say Jehoshaphat? his name right. Jehoshaphat and yes, his son married Ahab's daughter. Thank you. It's in um, chapter 20, 21, verse five through six, he married Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, whatever his name is, married his son married Ahab's daughter. There it is, correct. Yeah, it's not in verses 18 and 19, and I didn't have time this week uh, to go looking for it, but thank you. Okay, so yeah, his no son problem. married um, Jezebel's daughter. Yeah. Okay. It had been a while since I read that portion of the scriptures. Thank you. I appreciate that, Barbara. So that's how the affinity happened, and he's accused of loving them who hate the Lord because Ahab caused all the whole church to go into sin. And the wrath of God was upon him, even though God spared his life in the battle because of the good things he had done. Look at this, verse 3 of, of 2 Chronicles 19, 3. It says, Nevertheless, there are good things found in thee, in that thou hast taken away the groves out of the land and hast prepared thy heart to seek God. See, he was the one wanting to hear from a seer of the Lord before the battle. He was wanting to do what was right, yet this affinity with Ahab drew him into things that he shouldn't have done. Jehoshaphat dwelt at Jerusalem, and he went out again through the people from Beersheba to Mount Ephraim and brought them back to the Lord God of their fathers. So the Lord tells him, the wrath of God is on you, and he goes out to his people and says, let's get back to the worship of God. Let's do it right to avert that wrath from his people. So this is a wicked sort of love that causes us to think that we can help those who are against God and not listen to the prophet or the seer and just go ahead and, and join affinity and, and, and help those who, who are ungodly and love not the Lord. This is a wicked sort of love. This is, this is a, a wake-up call to us in our generation. Another wicked sort of love, Revelation 22.15. Do I have a reader? Revelation 22.15. I can if you want. Thank you. 2250. Yes. For without without a dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and 
murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. And whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. This is carnal love. Lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Loving those is wrong. It's wicked love, according mm. to the scriptures. And where are these people found? For without what? He's been talking about the New Jerusalem. Without the New sure. Jerusalem are those. That's not where we want to be, is it, brothers and sisters? We want to be inside that city when the fire comes down. Whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Is there more than one kind of love? Our paper asks, and yes, there is. We've seen that in the last several lessons, that there is more than one kind of love. Reading on here with Herman Hohen's comments, he says, love is not a complete word, and this is what the unconditional love goes against. They say love is all in all. It is complete, but love is not a complete word. And he says here, when a young girl comes into a room and says, I'm in love. Everybody holds their breath to hear what she loves and whom she loves, especially her parents. In their minds, they're wondering if the object of, their, of her affection is worthy of her love, hoping against hopes that she will have some good common sense to go along with her emotions, that she will realize that there are many types of love and not all of them are good. There is a, there's a lot of noise, somebody. There is a dangerous sort of love that will wreck her happiness for life if she puts love first instead of last, as the word of God has it on Peter's ladder. In these last hours of earth's history, we must understand this topic if we would be kept through the hour of temptation that shall come upon the whole world to try them that dwell on the earth. It all has to do with love. What kind of love we have. What kind of love we have. And this is why we're going over this because I see more and more people, well-meaning Christians, falling off the straight and narrow path because of the unconditional love theory. So... Who's behind, the wise will understand, excuse me, the wise will understand the difference between godly and carnal love. Let's look up first, um, Daniel 12, 10. Daniel 12, verse 10. Do I have a reader? Daniel 12, verse 10. I'll read. Thank you. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. So, the wicked will not understand. And we're told right there in that verse why they do not. Did you catch it? Why is the reason the wicked do not understand spiritual things? Because, because they're spiritually discerned. Yes, they're spiritually discerned. It says right here, but the wicked shall do wickedly. And she's right. Spiritual things are spiritually discerned. And it says in the word of God, sin hath blinded their eyes. So the wicked don't understand because the wicked are doing wickedly and they're blinded by their sin. But the wise shall understand. So we need to pray that the Lord will give us wisdom that is from above so that we can understand these things. Now, who is behind the push for this unconditional love? Let's turn to Daniel 8.25. Daniel 8.25. Do I have another reader? I can. Thank you. 
and through his policy. Also, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. And he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. And he shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. So who is the prince of princes that this power would stand up against? Who is the prince of princes? It's Jesus Christ. That's right. It's Jesus Christ, our Lord. It says, by peace he shall destroy how? Who? A couple people? Many. Many. By peace he shall destroy many, and he will be standing up against Christ, the Prince of Princes. So here we have a warning in the scriptures that this whole end scenario and game is about love. It's about peace. It's about unity. It's about getting along. This is the battle of Armageddon that ends in the voice of God hour because at the end of time, there will not be an unbeliever. Everyone, according to the scriptures, will be either on the Lord's side and for him or on the devil's side and for him. And we have a choice. Which side will we choose? So this tells us that the one behind this push for loving, everything and everybody and uh, just making love all in all is actually the power that has so long first for 1260 years they persecuted the saints and now because their blood was seed satan changed his tactics and this is how his final hour ends up is taking everyone in through this and i should just be reading this or having somebody else read it here on page 11 of our um, New Deals. There were 1,260 years of persecution. Um, somebody want to read that for us? There were 1,260 years of persecution and death for those people of God, yet they could not be stamped out. Their blood was seed, which caused more to long to have a love for God so deep that they would die for him. Satan, that prince of darkness, changed his tactics to gain followers. So in Daniel 8.25 tells us just how he would do it. By peace, by love, by unity, and acceptance of everybody. No matter. And this is what the Roman church did. Yes. And are still doing. And are still doing. So, um... We'll quickly read pages 41 and 42 here of Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, that tells us about this. In vain were Satan's efforts to destroy the Church of Christ by violence. The great controversy in which the disciples of Jesus yielded up their lives did not cease when these faithful standard bearers fell at their post. By defeat they conquered. Because so many more rose in their, in their place, and I'm adding that. So, um, God's work, excuse me, God works, God's workmen were slain, but his work went steadily forward. The gospel continued to spread and the number of its adherents to increase. In, it penetrated into regions that were inaccessible even to the eagles of Rome. By the way, that was, Eagles of Rome was the um, spies, the watchmen that went everywhere and joined this group and that group and then reported back to Rome everything and what everybody believed that they were with, okay? 
And that's still going on today. We have spies in every group, and they track Jesus too, so let's not panic about it. They'll have their uh, comeuppance shortly. Said a Christian expostulating with the heathen rulers who were urged, urging forward the persecution, you may torment, afflicts, afflict, and vex us. Your wickedness puts our weakness to the test, but your cruelty is of no avail. It is but a stronger invitation to bring others to our persuasion. The more we are mowed down, the more we spring up again. <coughs> Excuse me. The blood of Christians is seed. And so it was. And then on page 42, that's when Satan changed his tactics. He said, okay, I'm done. I got to do this a different way. So what did he bring? He brought in the peace, the love, the acceptance of all, the unity, those ruby red lips. Oh, come, be part of our fellowship. That was Satan's plan. He planted his banner in the Christian church. If the followers of Christ could be deceived and led to displease God, did Jehoshaphat displease God by helping Ahab? What did that verse say, class? The what of God is upon you? The anger or wrath of God is upon you. If the followers of Christ could be deceived and led to displease God, then their strength, fortitude, and firmness would fail, and they would fall an easy prey. The great adversary now endeavors to gain, endeavored to gain by artifice what he had failed to secure by force. Persecution ceased, and in its stead were substituted the dangerous allurements of temporal prosperity and worldly honor. Idolaters were led to receive a part of the Christian faith while they rejected other essential truths. They professed to accept Jesus as the Son of God. Boy, they don't even do that anymore. He's, a, he's another God and to believe in his death and resurrection, but they had no conviction of sin and felt no need of repentance or of a change of heart. With some concessions on their part, they pro proposed that Christians should make concessions, that all might unite on the platform of belief in Christ. Now, she says, the very next paragraph, she says, now was the church in fearful peril. Fearful peril. Prison, torture, fire, and sword were blessings in comparison with this. Some of the Christians stood firm, declaring that they could make no compromise. Others reasoned that if they should yield or modify some features of their faith and unite with those who had accepted a part of Christianity, it might be the means of their full conversion. That was a time of deep anguish to the faithful followers of Christ. Under a cloak of pretended Christianity, Satan was insinuating himself into the church to corrupt their faith and turn their minds from the word of truth. At last, the larger portion of the Christian company lowered their standard and a union was formed between Christianity and paganism. And that's what we see today. Christ said, Gather ye first the tares and bind them in bundles and then gather the wheat into my barn. What we have today are the tares all gathered together in bundles, preparing to be burned. They felt no need of repentance or a change of heart. Under a cloak of pretended Christianity, what's better? I don't know if you as a child have ever um, made a little mud pie. 
I did until I was seven and a half and moved off the floating log camp that we lived on in Alaska. I was so delighted to find dirt when I got to seven and a half years of age. I couldn't quit playing in it. And we'd put little, we'd take these little um, metal tins that my mom threw out and we'd take and we'd mix grass and stuff in. We spent hours just out there, my sister and I, just playing in the mud and squeezing it through our fingers, getting it wet and putting it in that. And then we'd lay them up on a, a block and we'd let them dry in the sun. But you know what? They looked like chocolate pie, but we couldn't eat them because it was just mud. They were pretend pies, we call them, pretend pies. And we'd show Dad when he came home, look, we got pretend pies. And he's like, I don't want to eat it. I wouldn't either. <laughs> I didn't want to eat it. So here we have pretended Christianity. What is better, true Christianity or pretend? What's better, a mud pie? Or a carob pie. I'd rather have a carob pie. <laughs> it's eatable. I would rather have a true Christianity instead of a pretended Christianity. Satan was insinuating himself into the church to corrupt their faith and turn their minds where? What, away from what? Turn their minds away from the Word of God, the Word of God. So it is today. So it is today. <laughs> Wanting to bring in their multitudes, the majority have set aside the pillars of the faith. We see the same thing happening today. So friendship with God haters is what is happening in the Christian church today. And if the followers of Christ can be deceived by this love and unity, they will be drawn away from our foundation and the Lord Jesus Christ. While the majority look to some future time for persecution, they fail to realize that daily they are being lured into the net of the adversary with the ruby red lips of the doctrines of devils. And the top of the list is unconditional love. There is an omega of apostasy and we are to meet it. Let's look that up. We have it here in selected messages. They actually got this from Special Testimony Series B, number 2, page 15. But you have it in your selected messages, and people have asked me, why do you use the copyrighted books? Because you probably don't have Series B. Um, Grumpy Guard died, and we were unable to get uh, released to us the plates from um, all of these books, so we've never printed them, but um, they're hard to come by, but some of this is in selected messages, so if you have this, you can mark it. So she says here, um, the Omega, let's see, what page is this? 1SM 197. Does somebody have their um, 1SM out? 197. I have, I have a, I go get it. Okay. We want to look at the bottom of 197, the alpha now seen. You know, when I was growing up, I heard pastors say, oh, we praise God that he squashed the alpha of apostasy and we, we are done with that pantheism and, and things that were, were such a scare back then. And I thought, wow, God has spared the church from that, you know. And now I look and realize, no, I was being lied to. It's everywhere. And the Alpha, while he's getting his book, let me just explain. The Alpha was one leader believing that God was an essence. He's in everything. It was off the Trinity uh, doctrine is, is where pantheism came from. But he started saying, oh, God is in the leaf. He's in the blade of grass. He's in the trees. 
He's in you and me. We just have to lay back and let it happen. And I've literally heard that preached clear up through college uh, from the, the preachers in Ahab's church, <laughs> the main line. Uh -huh. So, uh, brother, you have page 197 there, the alpha now seen. Can yeah. you read that paragraph yeah. for us, please, there? The one that says, be not. Yes, sir. Be not deceived. Many will depart from the faith. How many? Many. Many. Not a few. Many. Beware. We have to open our eyes to this, people. We want to be in a big group. I know that's nature. Go ahead, brother. Many will be, um, give, uh, depart from the faith, giving heed, seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. We have now, we have now before us the alpha of this danger. The omega will be of a most startling nature. And this is what I've been searching out the last few hours this morning, is this most startling, startling omega. She says, my message, this is in um, um, Series B. It's also, I think, in, in this one. Yeah. Um, but I'm not sure where. I forgot to look it up. But anyway, my message to you is no longer consent to listen without protest. I have been in independent meetings, actually OTG meetings, where before the preacher was to speak, a man would get up and say, we don't want you to say anything or, or to interject. If you don't agree with this speaker, leave it till later. Don't protest against what he's saying. And then they get up and they preach error. They preach uh, the Omega. Um, so she said, no longer consent to listen without protest to the perversion of truth. Unmask the pretentious sophistries which it received will lead ministers, which if received, excuse me, will lead ministers and physicians and medical missionary workers to ignore the truth. Everyone is now to stand on his guard. God calls upon men and women to take their stand under the bloodstained banner of Prince Emmanuel. I have been instructed to warn our people, for many are in danger of receiving theories and sophistries that undermine the foundation pillars of our faith. What are those foundational pillars of our faith? The sanctuary. Yes. Uh, the state, uh, the state of the dead. Non-immortality of the soul. The Sabbath. Immortality of the soul. The 2300 days. The 2300 days. Yes. Mm -hmm. And where the move made. So that brings us back to the sanctuary. Where we're to be now. Not in the holy place. Not in the outer court. Back to the, the sacrifices. We're to be in the most holy place. That's the only place, brothers and sisters, where sins are blotted out. At the, at when the times of refreshing come. If we're out fraternizing with those in the holy place where Satan appeared by the throne, and you're going to see miracles there, let me tell you, this is his final hour. He's going to put on a show that we better be grounded in the word or we're going to be taken away going, wow, look at that. He was healed. Wow, they brought fire down from heaven. That's what she predicted apostate adv adv Adventism would do at the end of time through the power of Satan. So some others are spirit of prophecy that the whole evangelical world um, mm -hmm. believes that prophecy ended um, way back when, but we have the spirit of prophecy, which is the magnifying glass to navigate us through these waters of the last days, giving us final events in their order and what the church would be doing, showing us how close we are to the coming of the Lord. Forget about the world. It's always been bad. Look at what the church is doing. That's our, our clue. And the ten virgin parable that the angel showed her over and over and over. She said, I am often referred to the ten virgin parable. It was fulfilled in 1844 with the wise and the, and the foolish separating. But she says, it will continue to be fulfilled until Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. So, uh, Revelation 14 the three angels' messages is another one of our pillars. 
Revelation 13 and 17 prophecies, and the imminent return. Now, I remember in Dallas, Texas, when they had a GC some years back, and Ted Wilson said, we, we're going to take the word eminent out of the eminent return philosophy that we hold because um, we don't see that it's going to happen. We've got at least 60 to 100 more years. And um, I was not shocked by that. I was sad to hear it. But what shocked me worse was that people were like, wow, yeah, he's right. And my mind said, no, he's not right. It Isn't is the health message also one of the pillars? Pardon? The health, the health message? Um, is, one, is that, will we consider that one of the pillars now? That yes. was, that's the right arm of the whole message because it is and yet it's not ever defined with all the others. But I can't help you like when we had for years and years after my cancer experience and we took people into our home for three months. The first and second months, almost, uh, you, well, it was with, with two patients. They kind of came to in about two and a half months. Most of them, I couldn't talk religious things and have them get it until well into the third month of healing. When your body is sick, you're not going to get it, brother. You're just not yeah. going to get it. So, yes, I think we would call it the laws of health. It would be the laws of health, but not the health message, perhaps. Correct. So, yeah. Something like that. Yes. So, um, and areas that we differ from the other churches, at least we're supposed to, we used to. Um, the deity of Christ, we do not believe he's another God. We believe he's the son of God. Come from the Father. Um, the Trinity, we don't believe in many gods. We believe that God is God alone and that the, the uh, Holy Spirit is him and his son working in tandem together for our salvation. Sinlessness is another thing the churches say, oh, we can't, we can't quit sinning. Then why did Jesus say to people when he healed them in his day, go and sin no more? Isn't that cruelty? What if I said to a child, pick up this suitcase and that little child tried to pick it up and of course it weighs more than them and they can't pick it up and I said go pick it up and they can't do it is that really rude of me to try and make them stress to pick up more poundage than their little body is would God really do that to us say go and sin no more it's impossible but do it we, we need to think these things through we have a Christian world out there that does not believe that you have to overcome sin. They believe that the, the atonement was finished at the cross and that Jesus keeps the law for you because you're not able to. And so um, these are some of the, the differences that we held at the beginning of the way and that the Advent band will gather and hold on to as they join the church of Philadelphia that was born in 1844 and came up to higher ground. If we want to go through, that's the, the church we will have to join. So, and it is not a visible church. It is not a visible church because there's always going to be the spies and the unconverted um, in those gatherings. So let's not try and... <clears throat> put our name on a charter. I had, I had a call or a email, excuse me, um, here a couple weeks ago, a fellow in Zimbabwe, I think it was, said, oh sister, we want you to put our names, um, and he listed out some names, of my family on your church records. I said, they're kept in heaven, go talk to God about it. I don't keep any records of names. So he's like, oh, you have no church. I said, no. We are all brethren, and Christ is our leader. And so that's how it is. And um, we had quite a bit of conversation back and forth for a few days before he was finally able to get it. Because mental, mentally, we are taught that you have to join a group. You have to be baptized and your name put on a book, or you're not saved. And that's not the way it is. 
It's a relationship with Christ that brings us together. One with Christ. Hey, so, Molly? Yes. Uh, when we, we had to leave the church, uh, and we were told that what we had to do was just love everybody, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the only thing that was important is love. And but there's a, uh, a, a, a can I read this little paragraph from Letter 53 of 1887? Sure. It's, it's a small paragraph. Sure. It says this goody goody religion that makes light of sin and that is forever dwelling upon the love of God to the sinner, encouraging the sinner to believe that God will save him while he continues in sin, and he knows it to be sin. This is a way that many are doing who profess to believe present truth. Amen. Amen. I just, I just can't believe our church is going to uh, apostatize so bad. You know, for a while I stood there like, how could this be? And then I started reading the counsel that was given, and it was, it was all over the place. If you continue to reject the testimonies that God has given you, you're not rejecting a little old woman, you're rejecting God. Warning after warning has come, and so it is. And so we, we were warned. And it says here in uh, Series B, number 2, page 16, the righteousness of God is absolute, absolute. That's why we can't be, I heard a sermon one time on being the gray man Christian. That's the best Christian. You can float over here into this group and just kind of mingle with them and show them the love of God and they won't know what you believe. Or you can go over here to the world and mingle with the world and they won't know. And that way, when persecution comes, they won't come after you. That's not a real Christian. But anyway, the righteousness of God is absolute. It's either black or white for us. We have to choose. Are we going to be on the right side or the wrong side? This righteousness characterizes all his works, all his laws. As God is, so must his people be. That's why Jesus said, be ye perfect, even as my Father in heaven is perfect. And you know what? It's not all that hard, people. It's just getting on our knees and say, Lord, I don't want to be in rebellion against your government anymore. I want to be obedient. And then showing by our lifestyle that we mean what we say. In all his pu public and private acts, in every word and deed, practical godliness was seen, and this godliness is to be seen in the lives of his disciples. And we cannot do this on our own. I was speaking last week to a fellow, and he was trying to go over all of this garbage in his life. And I said, surrender to Christ, give it to the Lord, and, and turn from it. Put off the old man with his deeds. And finally he said, don't you have anything else to say? Don't, I need help. And I said, well, you know, I guess I don't because really, truly, you must be born again. And if you're wanting to look for a pill, a potion, or something else to make you mentally and physically and spiritually, well, you've come to the wrong place. Jesus Christ is the answer for your sin-sick soul and getting over the guilt. You can go to a, a psychiatrist, you can go to somebody else and have them soothe you and tell you, oh, it's all somebody else's fault that you feel so guilty for this sin you've done. But that, and, and you can even have mesmerism. And, um, this is what psychologists do. They mesmerize your mind. And we'll go over some of that in a minute. Um, but it still doesn't take away the guilt. It just numbs you up here. So you can't hear the Holy Spirit saying, you need a Savior. You're a sinner in need of a Savior. Repent and be converted and turn to the Lord so you can have salvation. So there's only one way. Only one way. So back to this book, 1SM. Uh, from 196 to 205, he says, gives you some of the answers. But in early writings, um, in early writings, 
uh, page 88, he says, it's likened to a train and it seemed the whole world was on board. And as I, sorry, as I looked in um, Hohen's book here and Anna's book, um, it said, I saw the rapidity with which this delusion was spreading. A train of cars was showing me, shown me going with the speed of lightning. The angel bade me look more carefully. I fixed my eyes upon the train. It seemed that the whole world was on board, that there was not one to be left. Said the angel, they are binding in bundles ready to be burned. Then he showed me the conductor who appeared like a stately fair person whom all the passengers looked up to and reverenced. I was perplexed and my attending angel asked and asked my attending angel who it was. He said, it is Satan. He is the conductor in the form of an angel of light. He has taken the whole world captive. They are given over to strong delusions to believe a lie. So here is put in brackets above this I saw with rapidity this delusion that was spreading and spiritualism is put there and I don't know if you remember but a couple weeks ago we read on page 315 in Spirit of Prophecy volume 4 that let me just touch on it again um, is it 315 that um, no it's not that's the other one um, where it states that, Mark, do you remember the page number? Um, a God of Love is presented. Spiritualism is now changing its form. Um, I forget the page number. <laughs> what is it? 405. Spiritualism is now changing, thank you. Spiritualism is now changing its form, veiling some of its more objectionable and immoral features and assuming a Christian guise. Then skipping down, uh, and what I'm skipping is that she says they throw out the Bible. They make it uh, attractive to the unrenewed heart. A God of love. Now remember, we're talking about spiritualism that has changed its form and is now Christian, Christianized. A God of love is presented, but his justice, his denunciations of sin, the requirements of his holy law are all kept out of sight. That's what Ahab did not want to hear from the seer before they went to war, was his denunciations of his sin. So that is spiritualism. And so I looked up, the quote they have here by this is um, Review and Herald. Let me see if I can find it. I left these all spread out because I did this at the last minute. Um, book six of Review and Herald. This is um, January 15, 1914. The fall of the house of Ahab, which we've already looked at. Um, she says this about um, Ahaziah. Um, when he, uh, he was Ahab's successor, of course, he did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of his father, unfortunately. Conference president's son did no better than his dad. And in the way of his mother and in the way of Jeroboam, he served Baal and worshipped him and provoked to anger the Lord God of Israel. You know, when I was a little kid, I always thought, oh, of worshipping Baal, they go out and they, and they kneel down and they, they pray to this idol. It's not that simple. I mean, they probably did that too, but it entails other things in the lives which we see now with what's going on. So he falls through a lattice in the upper chamber and he's seriously injured. And instead of calling on the Lord, he sends um, some men to go, his servants, to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, whether or not he would recover. These messengers were met in the way by Elijah with words of stern rebuke. And when I read that stern rebuke, I thought, oh, he wasn't into the unconditional love theory of the Baal priests of Jezebel. 
that she had because they were all into unconditional love too. Um, but he had a stern rebuke for this king. And, of course, they went back and told him. And he said, oh, that's, uh, that's Elijah. And um, twice ah Ahaziah sent a company of soldiers, skipping down, to intimidate the prophet. And twice the wrath of the offended God came down upon them in judgments. They were consumed by fire. The third company of soldiers humbled themselves before God and their captain as he approached the Lord's messenger, fell upon his knees before Elijah and besought him and said unto him, O oh man of God, I pray thee, let my life and the life of these 50 of thy servants be precious in thy sight. Here was a man who feared God. He didn't come presumptuously. Behold, there came fire down from heaven and burnt up the other two captains in the former fifties with their fifties. Therefore, let my life now be precious in thy sight. The angel of the Lord said unto Elijah, Go down with him and be not afraid of him. And so he went down and he said, Thus saith the Lord, for as much as thou hast sent messengers to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, thou shalt not come off thy bed. So he says, Because you didn't search, seek the Lord's way, you went to ask of the god of uh, Ekron, the Be of Beelzebub, you you won't get well. The gods of e the god of Ekron was supposed to give information through the medium of priests. So this was a religious thing. Note that. So he was going to the church of Philistia to get help, but the predictions were uttered and the information given proceeded directly from the prince of darkness. And skipping on down, it says, Today the mysteries of heathen worship are replaced by secret associations and seances and obscurities and wonders of spiritualistic mediums. Believers in spiritualism may speak with scorn of the magicians of old, but the great deceiver laughs in triumph as they yield to his arts under a different form. When uh, there, there are many who shrink with horror from the thought of consulting spirit mediums, but who are attracted by more pleasing forms of spiritism, such as the Emmanuel movement. So she's coupling the Emmanuel movement with Beelzebub, the god of Ekron. And I thought, hmm, what's the Emmanuel movement? I, I, I want to chase this. What's the Emmanuel movement? So I went online and I typed in Emmanuel movement. What is it? And it says the Emmanuel movement was a psych psychologically based approach to religious healing introduced in 1906 as an outreach of the Emmanuel Church in Boston, Massachusetts. In practice, the religious element was de-emphasized and prim primary modulates were individual and group therapy. Ever heard of something like that? That was the Emmanuel movement. Now, I could t share with you, Worcester was the one, Elwood Worcester, who lived from 1862 to 1940, was the originator of the Emmanuel movement. And... Um, he was a psychologist and a preacher. <laughs> and so he coupled these things together. But one of the things I wanted to bring out here with all of this was he believed in helping bo body, mind, and spirit with Freudian methods of psychotherapeutic work. And you know what he started? Alcoholics Anonymous. That's where it came from. And how it became so popular was that it worked. But I'll show you how it worked. The Emmanuel Movement, this is Religion Online, um, Understanding and, the, and Counseling the Alcoholic by Howard Kleinbell, Jr. He says, the Emmanuel Movement is a salient of salient importance to one who would help alcoholics. Here was perhaps the earliest experiment in a church-sponsored psycho-religious clinic. Here was the first pioneering attempt to treat alcoholism with a combination of individual and group therapy. And it goes on to show 
that during the course of the movement, they helped so many people. It worked better than any other method. Um, they, they specifically, and I'll get to it, um, they specifically uh, put down the, um, oh, what are they called? One of the Christian groups that, that proposed um, surrender to Christ and asking him to help you overcome. Um, anyway, I'll try and find their name here in a bit. The Emmanuel program of therapy consisted of three elements, group therapy administered through classes, individual therapy administered by ministers and the staff at the clinic, and a system of social work and personal attention carried on by friendly visitors. So they surrounded this person and kept checking in on this person when they were at home, etc. cetera. Um, and he says here, excuse me? He says here, um, meanwhile, this movement, it, it, just, it just took off in two years' time. He says, meanwhile, we focused on finding new power to add to, to aid the work. So this was outside of Christ's power. And they would let him... They would let them go to a church where an organ would soothe them by playing, and then the choir would sing a song of commitment. And they weren't against that. But just going on here, the moral control of nervous disorders were much helped by this new form, new form of helping patients. For all practical, and I'm just skipping through all this. You can go online and read this about the Emmanuel Movement. For all practical purposes, the Emmanuel movement as such came to a close on Worcester's death in 1940, but it is noteworthy to see that therapists of alcoholics in this country and abroad took up his work after his death and streamlined it with psychology. The non-medical practitioners specializing in helping the alcoholics. How? They go on to show you through mesmerism. Other things discussed in class were habits, anger, suggestion, insomnia, nervousness, and prayer. The class always follow, was always followed by a social hour at the parish house with other alcoholics. So they got group help, one mind helping another. This is what I did, this is what I did, this is what I did. But mesmerism was at the top of the list. He says here, Careful diagnostic examination by a physician and in some cases a psychiatrist would help them see where that person was and why they were where they were in their um, disease. In the case of alcoholics, it was felt by Worcester that those who should be seen every day, especially in early phases of the treatment, the new, not who, that they should be seen every day, sorry, <coughs> the new non-alcoholic habits which the psychotherapy was implanting were to be treated as tender shoots until they took form. The patient was felt to need the daily support of his therapist. So where's your support now? It's on another human being, right? Not Christ. <clears throat> and new habits were firmly rooted. The therapist met the patient once or twice a week. Just how long the average alcoholic treatment took is not clear from the studied cases. In other words, they didn't write down how long they worked with these people. A treatment period could last up several months. So, and then of course, I've known alcoholics that have been free for 20, 30 years and they're still going to the classes or the um, uh, AA groups to support others that are just coming out of this. So, the treatment, here it is. The treatment included full self-revelation not surrender, I'm adding. Notice this. This is about understanding ourselves, not admitting. I'm a sinner in need of a Savior, and I've gone to the bottle because my guilt is so heavy, I can't bear it. There's no self-surrender here. The treatment itself included full self-revelation in which the patient poured out all the facts Physical, mental, social, moral, and spiritual. In other words, you're supposed to go before this psychiatrist and tell them all about how everybody in your life has done you wrong and you just feel so low, you have to have a bottle. He goes on to say, this unlocked 
hidden wholesomeness. To go on and on and on and on and on about the skullduggery in your life unlocks hidden wholesomeness. The second phase of treatment consisted of prayer and godly counsel to these people. But the chief aim was to teach the patient techniques to help himself and strengthen his spiritual life rather than praying for the individual. The third phase is a use of relaxation and therapeutic suggestions. So they would put him, and it goes through this, they would put, this is called psychoanalysis, which was um, really perfected in 1932. They would go through, hypnotize the patient, and then suggest to him, seating him in a recliner, he was taught to relax every muscle, calmed by soothing words in a monotone, and in a state of physical relaxation and mental quietness, he was then told, you want to overcome this, et cetera, et cetera, in dislodging all of these um, frame of mind that he'd had that caused him to go to the bottle. So this would relieve psychic tension, it goes on to say, and cause him to, to detest um, the excessive drink. I didn't underline that part, so I'm having to remember what I read earlier. The aim of Emmanuel therapy was the reconstruction of the inner life so the alcoholic would remain abstinent. No need of a savior. We can, we can just hypnotize you and, and uh, uh, change you. It takes a little time, but... Most alcoholic patients are highly suggestible, and I have found few who fail to respond to the technique intended to induce mental response and obstruction, abstraction and physical relaxation. Then addressing him in monotones, we offer him repeated suggestions in the positive. You have determined to break this habit. You're already gone days without the drink. The desire is fading out of your mind. These are all things they implant in them under hypnosis so forth and so on. In addition to the suggestion given by the therapist, the patients were taught to auto-suggest to themselves these same, same things. So that before they bring them out of hypnosis, they, they tell them, you need to tell yourself this every day. I don't like alcohol. I'm not going there. So if you see an alcoholic walking around saying that, which I have, um, you know where they got it. They've been hypnotized and their brain is full of somebody else's suggestions and they're just doing what they were told while under hypnosis and continuing the self-hypnosis program. <clears throat> that to me is not a free man. <laughs> That's under somebody else and they're thinking. This positive conception of man contrasts vividly with mission, here it is, of the Salvation Army doctrines of the impotent sinful man who can be saved only by surrender to an external God. But then they go on to brag that the Salvation Army people who say, submit to the Lord, surrender, tell him what you've done wrong, don't come confessing to me, I'm not a priest, go to God with it, and helping that person, they had less success in getting people to quit alcohol, the Salvation Army does, than through this hypnosis program of the AA. So he goes on to say, um, whatever the means used is religious, since the divine spirit permeates all life, the healing of body and spirits by medicine, rest, kindness, avid self-understanding, is just as much an act of God as healing, which depends on prayer and suggestion. Further healing of mind and spirit is not some sort of divine magic, but is the divine spirit working through the orderly forces of nature. This general orientation provided the basis for a thoroughly cooperative relationship between the various healing disciplines involved in Emmanuel therapy. And then he goes on to say there are many ways of healing the alcoholic through this psychology and, and uh, mesmerism, etc. But I remember the prophet of the Lord told us in 5T443, she says, there are many ways of practicing the healing arts, but there is only one way of which heaven approves. 
only one way of which heaven approves because there's only one way to be freed from the guilt of our sin and that is give it to the sin bearer, Jesus Christ, and surrender to him in obedience. But this is not what AA says. AA says you have the power within yourself. Oh, and don't forget group therapy. You're going to need all those 20 other people going through the same thing. You need to love and support each other because spiritualism is about worshiping your brother and your sister, not the God of heaven. That, that has been made plain over and over in the, in the New Age churches. The um, um, celebration churches, sorry. The health, their healthy needs are for increasing self-esteem. What does the Bible tell us about self? We must give it to the Lord. Self needs to die. We need to understand our self-worth. But when self is on the throne, then Christ cannot be on the throne. So this was really surprising to me that she, she would bring this Emmanuel movement up. This is the Beelzebub, the god of Ekron. It can help you over all your troubles, all your woes. Just go to a therapist. Oh, and don't forget those motivational speeches that don't mention the Bible. You, you can't mention the Bible. That is set aside. We have to to uh, help ourselves up by our bootstraps. This is the, the thing that we hear today. So the guilt they re remove by mesmerism, it's not asking God for forgiveness. It's, it's buried. It's still there. The problem is still there. He says here, um, this therapist, he says forgiveness was achieved in Emmanuel therapy not by petitioning an authoritarian deity but by modifying the unmerciful, unmerciful superego of our patient. So putting that in plain English, we're not going to go to God and tell him we're sorry for sinning because we don't want to give up all our sins. But we need something else so that we don't feel guilty for what we've done wrong. We need something else besides the bottle. So that instead of obedience to God and surrender to Christ, they have an attitude, they repress the negative attitudes towards self and build the positive. That's what AA is all about. So there you have the Emmanuel movement. I think that all ha also has to do with the um, uh, stop smoking clinics that Adventists have had for years and years and years. Um, I also wanted to read from Signs of the Times here, November 6, 1884. Science falsely so called. In these days when skepticism and infidelity so often appear in scientific guard, we need to be guarded on every hand. Through this means, our great adversary is deceiving thousands and leading them captive according to his will. I just looked at the time. I have a little bit more here. <laughs> Sorry. The ad advantage he takes of the sciences, science which pertain to the human mind, is tremendous. Here, serpent-like, he inter he imperceptibly creeps in to corrupt the work of God. This entering in of Satan through the sciences is well devised. Now listen to this. Through the channel of phrenology, psychology, and mesmerism, he comes more directly to the people of this generation and works with that power which is to characterize his efforts near the close of probation. The minds of thousands have thus been poisoned and led into infidelity. While it is believed that one human mind so wonderfully affects another, and this is what this is all about, going getting that group support, one mind fact affecting another, Satan, who is ready to press every advantage, insinuates himself and works on the right hand and on the left. Skipping down. It is a power which will yet work with all signs and lying wonders, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness. 
Mark the influence of these sciences, dear reader, for the conflict between Christ and Satan is not yet ended. In this disguise, he works upon the minds to allure from the safe and right path. He has ever been ambitious to counterfeit the work of Christ and establish his own power in claims. You know, there's only one way that God can reach us, and that's through the five senses. And if we numb them in any way, by drugs, by alcohol, by anything, by overeating, by eating the wrong things, if we shut down the senses to our mind, we're not going to be able to understand the truths for this time. We're going to be fighting against it because it goes contrary to the carnal heart. So this is the time we live in. From living temple to this, from the alpha, one man at the top, to an omega of choosing other gods and most of all the God of self not letting go so we're to meet this she said to meet it do not take it up meet it so this train is powered by universalism which is occultism springing up to some surprising to some who think spiritualism, Satanism, is the only idea of killing people, they would be surprised to learn why it fascinates so many people is because it zeroes in on love. So this whole thing of putting love first, I'm going to read this quote, uh, this comment here. When I was going to Chinese Sunday church, the membership putting names on church role is never a big issue. I'm a little surprised to see people with SDA background view church membership so important. Uh, we were told in the spirit of prophecy they would. They would want their names on something to show that they had salvation when that's not at all uh, what it's about. So thank you for that comment. Um, Review and Herald, book six. No, this is book four. I wanted to read out of this where, where or why, I'm not sure now. Mm. In these words, there is no soothsaying. No the speaker held up the living temple saying, in this book there are sentiments that the writer himself does not comprehend. Statements are made in such a way that nothing is sure, and this is not the only production of this kind that will be urged upon the people. That's what I wanted to read. Fanciful views will be presented to many minds. What we need to know at this time is what is the truth that will enable us to win the salvation of our souls? These sophistries regarding God and nature that are flooding the world with skepticism and the are the inspiration of the fallen foe. Let all beware. This is where we are now, now in this day and age. Um, reading on page 13, here are our last little bit. It says, Spiritualism chapter in, in volume 4, Satan holds people spellbound. How? with his eloquent portrayals of love and charity. This is so, this is so scary because this is all we're hearing now from pulpits from everywhere. So 373 here, she says, He who could appear clothed with the brightness of the heavenly seraphs before Christ in the wilderness of temptation comes to men in the most attractive manner as an angel of light. He appeals to the reason by the presentation of elevating themes. He delights the fancy with 
enrapturing senses and he enlists the affections by his eloquent portrayals of love and charity. So this is where we are. To the self-indulgent, the pleasure-loving, the sensual, the grosser forms of spiritualism are adapted and multitudes eagerly accept teachings that leave them at liberty to follow the inclinations of the carnal heart. How can we know if we're converted? Are we carnally minded or do we have the mind of Christ? This has been such a struggle for every person who ever walked the planet, including myself. Every day we have to continually think the words of Scripture instead of the words that Satan wants in our head. Multitudes eagerly accept teachings that leave them at liberty to obey the promptings of the carnal heart. So this publication that I wish um, we had done and you could have in your hands, I need to focus on it here. I've had so many other interruptions, but this publication is going to take us step by step through how the Adventist church has gone from living temple 1903 to the ultimate in love craziness with Wilson and his worshipers, what I like about Catholics, what I like about Mormons, what I like about Baptists, etc., etc. Love unconditional, more and more of this unconditional love or monomaniacism is appearing in the church publications and heard more and more from their pulpits and picked up and parroted in the pulpits of the independent churches and groups, splinter groups, until they have reached the Omega as far as they can go. As they did around the golden calf of celebration in the wilderness. She said that would happen again. I was sent this week a deal from Ecuador, I think it was, at Seventh-day Adventist Church where they had a girl in a white blouse and black pants. Um, kneeling down on a rostrum in an Adventist church and around her, and they're miming all this, are pantomimes, are people with death masks on, ghost masks, and, and all in mask and um, get up. And they did a pantomime, and they were playing a rock song, and this was done in an Adventist church. And we are told in the spirit of prophecy this would happen just before the close of probation, just before. Let's turn to Revelation 14. We're at the end of time, brothers and sisters. I had somebody email me yesterday and said, wow, look at what's happening. I think we better get ready for the coming of the Lord. And I shot back an email and said, you better be ready. Don't start getting ready now. Be ready. People wait till the last minute and they're going to miss the bus. Revelation 14. Verse 7. Do I have a reader? Revelation 14, 7. Saying with a loud voice, Fear God, give glory to him, for that hour of his judgment is come. Worship him that made heaven with earth, sea, fountains of waters. Fear God. The reason I'm ending with this one is because in many of the different Places we've gone, we've heard those in the pulpit saying, repeating this and then saying, now fear here means love. Fear means love. You have to just love. This is what fear God means. So let's turn to Proverbs 8.13. I laid awake half the night last night thinking. Well, it was, something came up when we talked about this, this verse before. Um, in part of, in where it says, and worship him that made heaven yes. with earth sea fountains of waters um, that seems to indicate that what we're talking about here say with a saying with a loud voice fear God that would be God Almighty yes. give glory to him for his for his hour of judgment is come yes. also worship him that made heaven with earth and all things because we know that everything was made by that Son of God Correct. And without him was nothing made. Correct. So we have to also acknowledge him in this verse. Right. At, at, not only as the Son of God, creator, co-creator, if you will, 
but also as our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm they glad, go together. I'm glad you point that out because I've said to people, well, the heavens and the earth were, uh, they say, oh, it was just spoken and it happened. But if you couple all the verses on the creation together, God commanded and it stood fast, but by the word of God were the of heavens. Of his power. The so word it's a father of his son power. deal where the dad said, or the father said, I should say, uh, son, I want you to do this and so. And he did it. He literally did it. He obeyed his father. So it was a joint effort. God commanded, that, his son obeyed. And that's spoken to in Hebrews 1 when it says, by the word of his power. His power is his power is in his word, and who's his word? The word his son, flesh and the man Jesus. Yes. yes, yes. Now let's go to uh, Proverbs eight thirteen. Proverbs eight thirteen. Does somebody want to read that for us, please? I can. Thank you. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance in the evil way, in the uh, forward mouth, do I hate. So what is fear? Is it just love? To hate, hate evil. evil. It's to hate evil. Pride and arrogance. Meet it. I had my orders, meet it. 